how that works. There we go. Awesome. All right. Well, I will kick things off um, for after. Um, my name is Jamie Rondo. I am a volunteer with She Jumps. I've been with She Jumps for uh, about five years. I am the regional coordinator in the Northeast based in New Hampshire. And um, I think most people do know that She Jumps is a national nonprofit. So we have um, events and volunteers all over the country. So I always like to Kind of make a plug for checking out the website and events we always do fundraising campaigns and things like that um but today we are so lucky to have sam crow um and i'm gonna i'm gonna give a little bit of info about sam because i feel like it is so awesome that we have her with us and um just kind of try to like take as much knowledge as possible so um, Sam is a certified mountain bike coach, avalanche educator, split board guide, and health coach. So a ton. Sam incorporates mindset coaching and health coaching into her skills programs and runs programs for female athletes to help them get back in touch with their inner wisdom and strength. And like she jumps, Sam has a mission to get more women out on bikes and skis and split boards, exploring both the external landscape of the mountains, as well as our internal landscape. These sports, as we know, can teach us so much about ourselves if we're open to listening. When Sam grew up, she wanted to be a therapist, helping people live a little happier and healthier. And when she went to college and traveled around, she picked up mountain biking and splitboarding, and her whole world changed. Being in the mountains connected her not only to her physical body, but her emotional and spiritual body as well. She started coaching and guiding and wanting to share that passion with as many people as possible, including this incredible She Jumps community here today. And as the years went on, Sam became more fascinated with the effects of mindset and nutrition on performance and ability to show up within each sport, both professionally and personally. Now she studied more and went back to school to become a health coach. Sam noticed a gap within the outdoor coaching industry, and it's become glaringly obvious that there are a lot of things out there that aren't really addressing the two, those two key things um, and giving credit to how much they can impact our time in the mountain. So by combining those passions, she's combined Sam, she's combined them all to create <laughs> Sam Crow coaching. And um, similar to She Jumps is incredibly inclusive um, and focuses on women, um, non-binary, people that identify with the women's community and really providing opportunities to connect with our bodies to help gain confidence and really just live a healthy and fulfilling life on and off the mountain. So Sam, I think I covered as much as I can about you and I'm going to pass it over to you so that we can learn more about what you have to offer in the workshop today. Awesome. Thank you, Jamie. You're so kind that the intro being done for me is so nice because it also just reminds me of all the things that I have my hands in as well. And um, I'm just so stoked to be, have this opportunity to um, collaborate with She Jumps here and present a workshop for you all. So let me get my screen shared here. Good to go. Okay. So this workshop is named Courage to Jump. And I did that because we're going over three big obstacles, mental obstacles that prevent us from going after what we're wanting to do, whether that be on our bikes, maybe it's off of our bike, maybe it's professionally or personally, we're trying to develop and um, get to the next level. Um, so we're gonna be diving into three different topics in this workshop, but before we dive in, let's take a quick moment to just settle into where we are now. A lot of us are coming from work, off of a hike. Um, we are coming in from all these different spaces. So taking a moment to settle in and breathe, especially when we're about to talk about mindset, it can be something that maybe activates some responses within our body, maybe reminds us of a scary moment. Um, so allowing ourselves to come back down and regulate our nervous system before having a conversation like this helps us retain so much more. So I'm going to invite you all to maybe close down your eyes for a moment and just check in with the body. Notice any points of tension. Maybe get some fidgets out, rolling out the shoulders rolling out the wrists, anything that feels good, maybe the neck, maybe the spine, maybe those legs.
And when you're ready, coming to stillness with your eyes closed, and let all the air out of your lungs. Breathe in through your nose, into your belly. And out through your mouth, slow and steady. In through the nose, soften that belly. Out through the mouth, relax and release. Breathe it in. And let it go. Two more. Breathe into the belly. Out through the mouth. Last one, in through the nose. We're gonna hold at the top. Hold for just a moment. Take one more sip in and let it go. Bringing your chin to your chest, honoring yourself for coming here today for a beautiful workshop with She Jumps, for your own self-development and progress. When you're ready, blinking your eyes open and coming back to the space. Awesome. So if you could already feel the shift that happened within four minutes, maybe, of doing that breath work exercise from where you were coming into this workshop to where you are now, the breath and the awareness is super powerful. And those are things that we're going to be focusing on throughout this workshop as well, because they come into our mental game while we're out mountain biking or doing any sport outdoors that activate our nervous system. And this is gonna allow us to come back down into our bodies and into ourselves and allow us to have our problem solving brain still activated. Okay, so what we're gonna be going over today is going to be overwhelm, negative self-talk, fear, and next steps. So starting with overwhelm, we're gonna go into two different categories because a lot of times when I hear about people being overwhelmed with the sport of mountain biking, it usually is with these two things, acquiring the gear and learning the skills. So gear, I always encourage people to start with what they have. So this picture is of me and my friend. It's my first year mountain biking. I'm wearing a work tank top, like literally it came from the place I worked at. I'm wearing an old REI day pack um, that had no structure to it. It was like one of those packs that like you were able to fold up into itself and carry on like another bigger backpack. Um, those chamois shorts that I'm wearing are from a thrift store. The only thing new I have are the gloves that I'm wearing and they were rad. They were like tie dye black and white and I was so proud of those. Um, the bike that I have was from a bike swap from a local bike swap. Um, and it definitely wasn't nearly as nice as the bike that I have now, but it got me started and it got me stoked. So start with what you have. Um, you can always borrow from a friend as well, or a friend of a friend. There's always somebody maybe with like an older mountain bike in their garage, just kicking up dust that you can borrow and go try it out. Go try it out for yourself. See if it's something that you want to invest in, first of all. Also getting used gears from the thrift stores or gear swaps. There's also the REI garage sale site. There's a lot of used gear sites and Facebook marketplace areas that you're able to acquire used outdoor gear for like a fraction of the cost. So it doesn't have to be super expensive and you don't need the top of the line things to get into this sport. After that, demoing and experimenting is something that helps you determine what works best for you. And if you are kind of curious about what kind of bike to get, what kind of tools you need and stuff like that, I encourage you to go back to the foundations of mountain bike workshop that I did with She Jumps previously. Um, we'll have that in the blog area, I believe, at some point. 
but that will be something that you're able to go back and watch. But trying new things and trying different things from different companies, as well as like different brands is super helpful to figure out what works really, really well for you. And then slowly acquiring upgrades. So this version of my mountain biking has slowly, slowly upgraded to where I am now. I've had, I think like, this is, I'm on to my third bike now over the course of six years, just kind of selling one and upgrading to another and then selling that one to upgrade again, because it was just like an incremental step each time. The bike got just a little bit nicer each time. Um, as well as my gear, the, a lot of the gear that I have is actually from my first years of mountain biking, but now I really know what I'm looking for in my shorts, in my chamois, in my shirts, um, in my gloves, in my knee pads, and I've kind of honed it in over the course of seven years. So allow yourself to slowly make those upgrades. You don't need to have all the big things right away. And I'm going to put this bare minimum list in the chat here of what you would need to maybe get started. The things that have question marks by them are things that you don't necessarily need, but like the gloves and knee pads are good safety pieces of equipment in case you do crash. So there are things that I didn't start, I started with gloves, I didn't start with knee pads, but I wish I would have because I nailed my knees on a lot of different things. Those are, I always tend to rail my knees on things. Um, but that's just a quick rundown of like, something, a list of things that you could use. So helmet is one thing that you definitely want. The hydration pack, like I said, you can use a day pack from your hiking expeditions, eye protection, just your usual sunglasses that you wear hiking or um, you know, in the day-to-day -day will work just fine. Um, first aid items, gloves, knee pads, and then the repair items you might have to acquire. And if you're not going for a really long ride, if you're just going out for a mile where you're able to like hike your bike back out, you don't necessarily need these things, but they are nice to have on hand when you start going for longer rides. And then all the clothing items can be from your other activities that you've been doing previously as well. And then maintenance, a lube and towel is like the bare minimum if you have a hand pump for your tigers, but the lube and towel are gonna allow you to maintain your drivetrain for a lot longer without it getting crunchy. Okay, skills. So, when we're learning our foundation of skills, the really good thing to do for yourself is mapping it out. What skills do you want or need to learn? Um, in that previous workshop, I did go over the nine fundamental skills for mountain biking, and I will put those in the chat as well. Um, but they are body positioning, braking, shifting, terrain awareness, cornering, and wheel lifts. So these are the, the base, these are things that I always go come back to at the beginning of every season and make sure that they are running efficiently and properly, that my body position feels good again, that my brakes are running well, that my shifting feels good, my terrain awareness hasn't come back down to my front tire, I'm able to lift up my head to where I'm wanting to go, my cornering feels like I can separate my body from my bike and move it around, the wheel lifts are, are feeling like timely and powerful. Um, so mapping out like where you're wanting to go is super important because when we're feeling overwhelmed, usually we're looking at point Z, right? We're not looking at point B, we're looking at the end goal. And that is really overwhelming. Like if you wanna be able to go to those bike parks and do those blue to black diamond runs and you're just starting, that's a far stretch, right? So allowing yourself to look at point B, C, D before getting to Z will allow that overwhelm to come back down. And then goal development. So create a learning based goal, not something that is based off of performance, but making a goal that is maybe like, I want to learn the nine fundamental skills, or I want to learn how to execute um, the green trail in my local area with ease and flow and allowing yourself to figure out what SOAP goals need to be put together in order to achieve that trail, in order to um, go through that trail with ease and flow. Um, I do also have a goal mapping workshop within the Summit Society, which is my membership community. Um, it's like about an hour long, so it goes really in depth to help you kind of go through the whole process of lining out your goal for yourself. Um, if that is something you're interested in, we'll get into more of that later. 
And then number two is starting small and slow. So mapping out the local green trails in your local area is super helpful. And here are the two websites that you can use for finding the trails in your area. There's trailforks.com and the mountain bike project. These can be super helpful for you to feel empowered to go out on your own ride, for you to know what's coming up in the trail that maybe you're gonna go do with a friend. You can get a brief overview from those different websites. You can have the apps on your phone so you know where you are at all times. It gives you a little geo tag, but starting small and slow. Um, and then getting into skill development. So skill development is something that I do probably a couple times a week for about 15 to 20 minutes. And so it's not a long time. I usually get to the trailhead like a half hour before my friends, kind of get my gear on slowly, practice some skills in the parking lot or on my lunch break, I'll go into my driveway and practice a few skills that I'm working on. But the skill development process versus just going out and riding every day helps your mountain biking go so, so much further. It helps you to be able to take those skills and make them automatic on the trail. And we're gonna talk about why creating those skills to be automatic are so important later on when we talk about fear. And then number three is mentorship or friendship. So if you're not able to find somebody in your area or a friend that is able to give you mentorship, that is a couple steps ahead of you, then finding a friend that can go through this process with you is a super helpful thing to, to do. So when I started mountain biking, I started, and same with backcountry skiing, actually, um, I started with a group of friends. All of us knew nothing. We were kind of going into it blind. I did learn a lot of like iffy habits, but I also learned a lot of really good things really quickly because we were out there pushing and challenging ourselves together. So you don't always need somebody who is well above how you're like how you're currently riding. You can find somebody that is looking just to get out there with you um, that also wants to progress. Negative self-talk. So the next category, we're gonna be going over that, that mixtape in our brain that's going off about all the things that we're not quite good enough at um, and all the things that we wish we were better at. So the first step to negative self-talk and overcoming it is awareness. So you can't change something that you're not aware of, right? Um, and if we're not aware of the mixtape going on in our brain that is harmful, then we're not gonna be able to change it. So how do you talk to yourself when you nail it, when you do a really good job? Are you like, ah, I just got lucky. Like that so-and-so did that before I did. That wasn't actually that cool. Or how do you talk to yourself when you fall or fumble? Like, ah, oh, man, I just, I suck at this. I can't do it. So-and-so can do it. But for some reason, this just, it maybe isn't for me. When you decide to walk a feature that maybe other people didn't, or you're by yourself and you walk a feature when you're slower than the rest of the group or with you go, when you go out with new people. So it's just starting to think and create awareness around these different scenarios within your mountain biking and how you're talking to yourself. Honoring that this is really hard. So this is something that I'm taking from one of my um, therapy fr therapist friends, actually. She came onto the Summit Society and talked to us about um, therapy and how it can help us out in our sports. And she said one of the biggest things for her and her clients is honoring the heart. So a lot of times we're putting ourselves down without actually acknowledging the difficulties and challenges that we're facing. So even if the negative self-talk is happening, acknowledging what you're feeling and going through is hard can be very validating, even though it's just from you. So we're not trying to shove it down and create more negativity but actually say like, yeah, Sam, it is hard being in the back of the pack. Or yeah, Sam, it is hard to walk your bike over something that you really want to do and you wish you could do. The next step is checking in. So is this something that you want to do? If the negative self-talk is coming up around one singular feature or one ride that you're attempting. Um, we want to release the shoulds and release the expectations. So the shoulds are like, I should be able to do this. This is coming from a place of lack rather than a place of like curiosity and excitement. Um, so a lot of times I posted this picture right here because this was a drop that I did. Um, gosh, 
a couple years ago now. And I remember thinking to myself like, Ooh, that looks like so much fun. And I was like, I could, I think I could do that. And then I watched a whole group of people go through it. And I was like, Oh man, that was so cool. I like, that was awesome. And I was like, Oh, am I doing it just because everybody else is doing it? And I want to look cool like everybody else. And when I got down to it, it really was that I wanted to do it. However, a lot of times when we get in that group think or are around a lot of other rippers or are out with a big group of people that are also attempting different features, sometimes group think in a different sort of manner can come up and push us into things that maybe we're not ready for. So allowing yourself to be soft, be kind with yourself, give yourself compassion. Is this something that you really want to do and that you feel that you're ready for without the expectations from others and yourself and without the shoulds of you should be able to do it. So if the answer is no, give your per yourself permission to honor your no and let it go. The more you practice this, the easier it becomes. So I know a lot of times it's hard to say no and walk away from something and the negative self-talk can heighten. But the more you practice honoring that no, the quicker you're gonna be able to decipher between what your real yeses are and your real no's are. If the answer is yes, then we're gonna move on to the next step. So anchoring in, what is your why? How can you focus and bring more of your why into that experience? So maybe you have a why for that particular ride. You're out with your girlfriends, you haven't seen them in a long time and you're so stoked to be out with them and catch up. Or maybe you have uh, a why that kind of is a common thread amongst all your outdoor sports. And for me, my why across all sports is connection, whether that connection be to myself, to the others that I am with or the nature around me. And I encourage you all to kind of figure out what your why is for these outdoor sports as a whole, because it is super empowering and is a really, really strong anchor to come back to when negative self-talk is like rearing its ugly head. Um, so I'm gonna give a couple stories here. So. I had a why for a particular ride. My husband and I went to Logan, just like maybe an hour north of where we are for a little like vacation away from home. And we were going for a mountain bike ride. I had just worked like two weeks straight and was looking forward to having just a leisurely trip out with him and just enjoying myself on my bike. And my husband is super fast. He's like the energizer bunny. He gets so far ahead of me so quickly, so easily and effortlessly. It's, it's nerve, it's like frustrating sometimes. Um, but he was way ahead of me. I couldn't see him anymore. And I felt the negative self-talk coming in. And I was like, yeah, this is hard. So I was honoring the hard, like, oh, this is hard being way back here and feeling like out of breath and feeling like I'm slow right now. And then I checked in and I was like, is this something that I'm wanting to do right now? And I was like, heck yes, I wanna be out here. I've been looking forward to this for so long. Awesome. So what can I anchor back into? And that trip for me was to have a sense of lightness and freedom. So I just wanted to let go of all my previous responsibilities and just enjoy myself and be in my body and be outside for that weekend. So how can I be more my body and more present in this moment? And I allowed myself to like pick up my line of sight. I wasn't just grinding with my head down to look around me to maybe stop and take a few snack breaks and picture breaks to have the freedom of just like whatever I wanted to do, obviously my husband included, um, I was gonna do. I didn't need to get up that fast. I didn't need to push myself to full exhaustion. The whole point of this was to connect with him and to be outside and to have that ease throughout the bike ride. So that was one anchor in for a particular ride. Um, and then for my biking as a whole, like I told you all, it's connection. So I always come back to that when I do feel maybe a comparison, negative self-talk coming on, or I feel like expectations are starting to rise in my body and in my mind. I come back to that connection. How can I connect more with myself right now? How can I connect more with the natural world around me? Or how can I connect with the others that I'm biking with right now? And a lot of times that helps me just settle right on down, gets you out of that negative mixtape because a lot of times it is just a mixtape. And until we interrupt it, it's just gonna keep playing. I find Sam that so many people also, maybe they don't verbalize it, but they're there for that same reason too. It's like always when I 
try to meet up with women that are way better than I am or whatever. I'm like, I don't want to hold you back. And they're like, I will have fun no matter what, like I am here for that. Like, I just want to have fun and bike ride. And it's like, you have to sort of step back and, and think like other people are in it for that reason as well. Most of the time. Totally. Yeah. So opening up and being vulnerable with your group of like, Oh, Hey, I'm feeling like I, I I'm feeling a little exhausted. I would love to just like sit back here and catch up with y'all or go at a pace that I feel like I can talk at and catch up or, um, whatever that looks like allows them to open up and be vulnerable too. Right. So it's kind of a gift that you're giving to your group. If you are open and like talking about what your expectations are for that ride or what you're looking for and needing out of that ride, it allows others to speak up and give their opinions and needs as well. So you can all support each other a little bit better. Yeah. Strengths. So this is something that would be done off the trail. You're not going to be making a list on the trail while you're biking. That would be really difficult unless you have a really good memory. Um, but what are your strengths? And always come back to these. We forget about our strengths so often because they feel so automatic and understated. They are like these things that we naturally are good at in every area of our life or maybe a couple areas of our life, but we like undersell them. We're like, ah, I like, sure. Like I'm a really good encourager and like welcomer. And I like allow everyone to feel like more comfortable in the group or I am the best cheerleader out there. Like if somebody's attempting to do something, like I'm right by their side and making sure I'm giving them a spot or cheering them on. Those are awesome strengths. Those are not to be undersold. Um, and I hear those a lot from people. And those are the reasons that people are inviting you on these rides because you have strengths that they don't have, or maybe they do as well, but your strengths are just as important and valid and beautiful as the strengths of like being a strong climber, if not more so being a strong climber or a strong biker. So making a list of what your strengths are as a biker to the group and to yourself. Another powerful exercise is asking three friends to tell you what they see your strengths are, what they think that you are so, so good at. And this can be actually really, really like eye-opening to how people actually perceive you. What you think your weaknesses are, people, other people might see as your strengths. It tends to be what we focus on is what we're working the most on, which is what the mo is the most present to other people, but we don't see our progress in it because we are so hyper fixated on it. So allowing three friends to come in and maybe getting a group of three friends together or a couple of friends, two friends, even one friend and giving it to each other, giving it back and forth. Hey, I see your strengths here and I see your strengths here. And it can be this really like beautiful experience and like also bonds you a little bit closer as well. And the sport is different for every person. So creating your own unique style within mountain biking, within climbing, within hiking is something you can do. I think a lot of times we put mountain biking in these sports into boxes of what we think that they should look like and what good looks like. And honestly, I have a, like an array of friends that are always like, that are down for all kinds of different things, but they all have their own strengths. So I have like a cross country phenomenon. I have like uh, this, if I want a good conversation, I'm gonna invite this friend. We're just gonna be pedaling along and having the greatest conversation ever. I have bike park friends. I have like just the casual like cross country friends and we all do that like rides together. I'm not saying it's just exclusive, but we all have our own strengths and styles to these sports. So allowing yours to kind of develop and evolve as you experiment and get curious with what you want this sport to look like for yourself. Okay, the CTC mantra. So um, this is the PC version. It's cut the crap mantra. Um, and basically this is your like fail safe, your thing to fall back on when all that other stuff, maybe you forgot it. Maybe you forgot all those steps of like checking in, um, of anchoring in and you're like, I just need something quick to go to. So we're gonna turn those negative thoughts on their head and switch them around and create a mantra of your own. So the one that I came up with within my backcountry skiing was I'm powerful, I'm confident, I'm strong. It was because I felt the opposite of all those in that moment. Um, and creating a mantra that you're able to stick with for a couple of months is the way to go because these mantras don't stick after the first try or the second try or the third. 
they take time and consistency to start to automatically take the place of those negative thoughts. So after about a month and a half of Im implementing this cut the crap mantra within my own backcountry skiing and mountain biking, it finally like concreted in and did get easier within that month and a half. But at that month and a half mark, I was noticing as soon as I felt like down on myself and the negative self-talk started to spiral, that mantra actually just like took its place so quickly. And it was this really beautiful experience to have that like I had the power over what my thoughts and what my beliefs were in that moment. Um, and it does take time, it does take consistency, but it is so, so worth it because our beliefs determine our thoughts, which determine our words, which determine our actions, which determine our reality. And if we're able to start switching those thoughts around, then our words are gonna be different and our actions are gonna be different then our reality is gonna be different. And then inevitably our beliefs are gonna change about what we are capable of. Professional athletes also use these mantras a ton. So you'll see athletes maybe have a song or a whistle or a word or a mantra that they use before they drop into a line or before they go out for a race. Um, and that just allows them to come back into their body and into a more stable nervous system. So it's not just something that I'm saying works really well. It's something that professional athletes use across the board. And I think that's really, really cool. Okay. Any questions on the overwhelm or um, or the negative self-talk yet? No questions in the chat, but I have something for you. Sam, I'm curious if you've ever had a point where you've had to just sort of, when you say like, honor your no and let it go, I actually wrote that down. I feel like that's a nice line and a good thing to remember where you've just been like, today isn't the day and you have like stepped away from a ride or you've like cut something early. Do you ever get to the point where you're like, I know like it's not gonna click for me today. I'm not gonna like get through it and that's okay. Yeah, um, for me, so it, it, it takes some, it takes practice to be able to decipher between um, what your hard no's are and what your yeses are sometimes because they can kind of feel entangled and a little bit messy at times. Like if you're like, I, I think I wanna do this or I, am I saying no just because I'm scared and like I want, I actually could do this and I'm just kind of holding myself back that area can get really, really gray. Um, after you take the shoulds away, like I should be able to do this. Like, okay, without the shoulds, do you, do you want to do this? Would it feel really good to do this? Is the calm voice in your head saying like, yes, this is the time you can do this. Or is it the voice that's coming from like lack and um, like, if I don't do this, it means I'm not a good biker or I'm not as good as I say I am. Um, I feel like, am I answering your question? Actually, can you? Totally. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's like practicing understanding even where you're coming from yourself on like what that reaction is and what the root of it is. That's great. T totally. Um, and throughout this next section of the fear of falling, we're going to be going over like nervous system regulation. So a lot of times when we're wanting to do something, the nervous and like part, like we're torn between if we should or shouldn't, if it's the right thing for us to do now or not, um, our nervous system being so activated actually like shuts off the decision-making and problem-solving part of our brain. So being able to regulate the nervous system will actually help you decipher between the no's and the yeses. Um, so we're going to be going over the fear of falling. Um, I do have a fear. If you have the fear of failure as well, there's a workshop for that within the Summit Society as well that you can go through. It's super, super powerful. But this is the one that I find is the most prevalent amongst mountain bikers, especially new ones that maybe have had a previous crash before or getting into it and are just like a little bit timid and nervous getting into the sport. So your body and fear, your amygdala initiates the fear response, right? Your sympathetic nervous system engages, our heart rate goes up, our respiratory rate goes up, our blood pressure goes up, adrenaline is released, cortisol is released, our muscles become a little bit tighter, our pupils dilate, maybe we start sweating a little bit, and blood flow is reduced to the prefrontal cortex area. 
prefrontal cortex area is our most evolved part of our brain. This is the part of the brain we want on so that we're able to make really good decisions for ourselves. But essentially we're in the state of fight, flight, or freeze. And a little bit of this is good. It prepares our body for what we're about to do. And so sometimes it's as simple as reframing this nervous or excited feeling into your body is actually preparing yourself for what is coming up. But if it's a little bit too heightened, we're gonna get into that as well. But sometimes, and a lot of times for myself, if I'm out challenging myself on the trail and I know I'm capable of something, I'm really, really at this point, really keen on the skills that I can execute well and the skills that I can't. So it's very rare that I attempt something that is wish-washy now. And you'll get to that stage once you, once you like have more years under your belt too, I think it just comes with time and with getting to know your body and your skills. Um, but allowing that reframe to come up of like, okay, my body is preparing myself, this blood, this heart rate going up, this respiratory rate going up, this adrenaline and cortisol that I am feeling throughout my body is getting me ready for what I'm about to do. And how cool is that? But when the fear is just a little bit too much, we have tools. So that breath work that we did beforehand was just elongated exhales. So long and slow exhales. You don't have to focus on the inhales and how quick and sharp they are. Just focus on the exhales and making them a little bit slower and a little bit more intentional. So if it helps you, you can do like a, a four, eight breath where you breathe in for four and out for eight, in for four, out for eight. Um, then there's horse lips, which is actually one of my personal favorites. At first it felt really, really weird, but now I do that quite often. And I have a friend that does it quite often as well with me. And basically that's just like softening your lips and blowing out air at the same time. We did it as kids when we we're frustrated with something, you know, you're just like, you know, it was actually a form of release of that frustration and of that stress, right? So it works really, really well. And you can do this while you're biking. So like when you're going into a line that maybe you're a little bit scared of, like practice doing that horse lips. Like, I don't think anybody's going to see or hear you. And if they do, it's probably just going to be funny or they're going to be wondering what you're doing and you can share it with them. If you feel that fear is coming on a lot, um, the butterfly hug is something that will even take somebody back from a panic attack. So if you do have friends or you're somebody who experiences high anxiety, the butterfly hug is super powerful. So basically you crisscross your arms over the front of your body and you just tap back and forth while you breathe in and out. And you don't have to time your breath with the tapping at all. It doesn't really matter. It's just this bilateral movement accompanied by your breath that helps just bring the nervous system right down. And then the shaking. So the shaking is something you'll see animals do. You'll even maybe unconsciously do it after a close call. You'll be like, whoa, that was crazy. Um, but just shaking out and like kind of getting the nerves out of your body. I'll do this before like something really scary that I'm excited for. Um, and it just allows those um, hormones to like flush out through your body and your body is like, okay, the, the thing that we were afraid of is gone now, even though we're still about to do that. But this signals to the body that we're okay and we're safe. Um, let's see. So when we do this, this basically allows the blood flow to come back to that prefrontal cortex, the part of our brain that does all the decision-making and problem solving. And when we're going into something new, something that we have to think a little bit more about, that is essential. Once we get to um, our skills being automatic, this isn't as essential. We're able to like kind of move through things pretty easily. Um, but until then, we need that decision-making brain, that slow part of our brain to come back on. And sometimes this is all it takes is one of those tools. So picking your favorite and trying it out for a couple of weeks on your bike and seeing how it helps. But if it doesn't, maybe it's time to take a step back. If your nervous system is still so unregulated, that probably means that we're not ready for that in that moment. And that can be hard to hear and hard to feel, but it is also okay. It is just a sport. And the whole reason we are out there is to have fun and experience new things. Um, and sometimes new things is stepping away from things. A lot of us, especially perfectionists or natural born geniuses or natural born athletes don't like walking away from things, but taking a step back can be the right thing. So once you take a step back, 
if you're still wanting to kind of process and move through, maybe visualizing what you need to make happen. So closing your eyes and envisioning like, what is each step that I would need to do? What is each skill and maneuver that I would need to do in order, in order to get through this one feature or part of the trail? Um, once you visualize that, do you have all those skills in your bag? Awesome. If yes, maybe this, maybe you are ready to go for it. Maybe you can see it a little bit more clearly now. Um, if not, then cool, let's go back to some smaller features and create some repetition and skills development on smaller features. Um, we need that skill development in order to create more automatic moves within our mountain biking you know, skills. Um, if we are going through like a skills clinic, if you've ever gone through a skills clinic, you'll notice there's a lot of mental effort going on because you're learning a lot of new things. It's really hard. As soon as they are like, okay, now focus on your feet. You forget everything about what they just said about focusing on your upper body and hips. You're like, oh, now I'm back to square zero. It's because there are so many new things coming in to you that, that aren't automatic yet. We're shifting a little bit too quickly. So allowing yourself to get more automatic with certain parts of the skill and then moving on to the next step will help you be able to build up on top of it with a little bit more ease and grace. So taking a step back, maybe that's visualizing, maybe that's repeating on smaller, um, smaller features. Maybe this is skill development back in your driveway, a grassy field, or like a progression park. Proactive fear management. So um, this is from a sports psychologist, Dr. Craig Manning. He wrote the book, The Fearless Mindset. Um, and for him, he's all about those learning-based goals, all about creating more objectivity in our goal process versus like, I just want to be a better biker. It's like, okay, what does a better biker mean to you? Let's get really clear on that. What do you want to move forward with here? So you pick one to two things to focus on for that ride or for that climb or for that run. Things that you can control. So these don't look like I won't fall. I will clean everything. I will finish this ride. I won't get off my bike. Those are things we can control. Depending on how we're feeling that day, maybe on our energy levels that day, maybe on our skills that day, those aren't something that we have complete control over, even though we wish we did. This looks like body positioning. So I'm gonna get a little bit lower on my bike when going around the corners today and just see what that feels like and see how that allows me to move my bike a little bit more. This could be, I'm going to work on my pedal efficiency while going uphill and try to use that whole circle and range of motion to get that efficient pedal stroke through. Maybe this is a bike angulation. I'm going to work on moving my bike more to the side as I go around the corners or line of sight. I'm going to pick my eyes up a little bit further down the trail moving forward here. So this reduces the perfectionism tendencies and the need to be good at everything all the time right away. It also allows you to see progress in one particular area. When we're not focused on anything, we kind of tend to see no progress happening anywhere. So it, it also just helps us have more of an attitude of less of needing to prove ourselves a little bit less, of needing to clean a feature that maybe you aren't ready for, um, and just allows us to have that focus on one thing and allow us to let go of the rest. Another thing to do to have proactive fear management on your ride is to have a discussion with your group on the expectations for the ride. So what is everyone looking for out of this ride? Are we looking to catch up and have a social get together? Are we looking to get our endurance on? Are we looking to go to the bike park? Are we looking to push ourselves, to challenge ourselves or just take it easy? And then when everybody is on the same page, it just allows you to kind of get at more ease or also opt out of a ride that maybe isn't what you're wanting at that moment or needing at that moment. Also, if it's a new trail to you, ask them to stop bef before bigger features or describe the trail to you. So you can try to see what's coming up ahead um, and plan for what you're needing and maybe where you wanna put those breath work and horse lips act like tools to use. So picking one to two things to focus on for that ride, things that you have control over, having that discussion with the group on expectations. And then if it is a new trail, asking them to describe it to you or stopping before big features so that you don't roll into something unknowingly. 
I'm a big fan of that. I love like, especially going somewhere new, like peeking over something or taking a look before I go or watching somebody do it who's done it before. I'll take a step back. And then sometimes, you know, you go up and you have to try again, but um, sort of that helps calm any fear of the unknown. I think it's just like good safety practice in some spots too, but I like incorporating those two things um, into moments like that. It's like, what can you do to help overcome? It's very cool. Totally. Yeah. I definitely look like looking at things beforehand too. There are some people and there are some instances in which I'm like, okay, I, I just want to roll through this. You know, my skill level right, really well. Like if you're able to do it and you think I'm able to do it, I'm going to just follow you through. But most of the time, the majority of the time, I like to see things for myself because there are different styles as well of how one person hits that drop or jump is going to look different than how I hit that drop or jump. So looking at things beforehand is a really good thing. And then after that, if you're going through another lap, then maybe do it without stopping. Awesome. So feel free to submit any questions into the Q&A box. I don't think there are any right now. Is that correct? That is correct. Cool. But we are going to go into next steps. So let's keep this going. I've got three opportunities for you all today. Um, and if you're watching this recording and you go to use these coupon codes or go to my website and don't see what I'm offering here, feel free to email me at samcrowcoaching at gmail.com. Um, but my most current offering should be available for you at samcrowcoaching.com. So the Summit Society membership, if you really liked this workshop, this style of workshop, the fact that we're going into different mindset, um, tools and tactics, you're gonna love the Summit Society membership. It's a place for all the women in the mountains to come together for a real talk. It's for climbers, bikers, runners, skiers, hikers, backpackers, everybody who loves playing outside in the wilderness. So it includes mind, body, spirit trainings to help you show up fully on the mountain. The training topics that we have previously had are fear of failure, imposter syndrome, embracing the ups and downs, goal mapping, goal mapping, <laughs> goal mapping, and limiting beliefs. Um, so if you actually, if you sign up now, you get access to all of those trainings. So the training library um, that you can do at your own pace on your own time. You also have access to me through the platform to ask questions and gain support throughout if you need. And there are also guest expert chats, which I just included recently. This will be our third month doing them. And we get experts, athletes, entrepreneurs, guides to come in and talk about what they know best. So our previous months, we've had a personal trainer come in. She actually gave us a mobility exercise that I love doing before going out to bike or run. We had a therapist come in and gave us some really cool tools to help use during different difficulties or challenges within our riding. And then we are gonna have a dietitian coming in this month to talk a little bit about macros for the athlete. Um, and I'm going to be doing a training on intuitive nutrition. So you'll be getting two different sides of the nutrition spectrum and what that can look like for you. Cause something that works for one person doesn't necessarily work for all people. Then I always, throughout the trainings, they're super interactive. They're not just me spewing everything to you. I'm going to be asking you questions. I'm going to be giving you space and time to journal and reflect. These are going to be a lot of answers that are coming from within because yeah, I know a lot, but I don't know everything and I don't know what's going to work for you. So the she jump special, you're going to get 50% off your first month, which brings it down to $22. If you use the code she jumps at the checkout, she jumps 50 that is. And here I will put the web page to that here. Um, so if you want to join that membership, you can can't join and cancel at any time. So this is like a gym membership. You can come for a couple of months. You can come, you can sign up for a year, whatever feels the best for you and wherever you're needing the most support. So maybe your summers are really busy or your winters are really busy and you come and join us for your off season. And the code is she jumps 50. The second offer is the Summit Sisters mountain bike program. So this is a self-paced virtual mountain bike program um, with a little bit of a holistic spin and approach to it. This is for you if you have a busy schedule and you need to do it on your own time. If you like to rewatch skills and have breakdowns multiple times, 
Um, if you benefit from solo practice, honestly, I think everybody benefits from solo practice. If you have time, 15 minutes a couple times a week to dedicate towards your mountain bike skills, it's gonna take your mountain biking so, so far. Um, if you need more focused time on certain skills, if you have gone through a clinic, but now wanna refine them, or maybe you're going into a clinic and you wanna have some of those more automatic, automatic responses so that when the coach is teaching you how to do a front wheel lift, you're not worried about your body positioning, where your hands are on the brakes, how, what gear you're in, all that is automatic. So you can focus solely on the wheel lift itself. So this program includes nine fundamental skill videos. So everything that I listed before from body positioning, braking, shifting, terrain awareness, cornering, and the four wheel lifts, front, rear, pop, which is both wheels and the pedaling front wheel lift. You also have access to me throughout and I invite you to send me videos if you're having troubles getting through one of the skills or modules. There are eight educational modules ranging from everything from bike maintenance to um, mindset to nutrition to endurance building. There's a lot of goodies in there and you can do the skill videos and the holistic modules on their own or intertwined together. You get to pick your adventure within this program, which is really, really fun. There's also a lot online community where other people are asking questions and sharing experiences as well. So the She Jump Special is you get $100 off this program for the first 10 signups. You can use the code SheJumps100 at checkout. And this is that website link there. So it's samcrowcoaching.com slash mountain bike dash program. Um, so originally this program caught, well, right now at the time I'm recording this, the program costs $540. And you all get it for $440 and you get access to this for two seasons. So you're able to go through the season and develop those skills. And then at the beginning of next season, you can come back to those. And I highly encourage you to, to refine those before getting into the next season. And then last offer here is the one-on-one -on -one mind body coaching, which is my absolute favorite. I love doing one-on-one -on -one coaching with people. I think it is so freaking powerful. We dive into things like intuitive nutrition, lifestyle balance, building mental resilience and goal mapping. I've already met with a few of you from the previous um, workshop on the fundamentals of mountain biking. And it's so awesome meeting so many different women from different walks of life, different um, levels of experience, and just getting to know what they're working on and what they're excited about. So these are really beautiful opportunities. It's an exclusive hangout, just you and I for an hour going over what you're needing to focus on. So these can be like the catalyst to your mountain bike season or climbing season, or just personal development for the summer. We can um, dive in further to any of the things that I just previously talked about, like overwhelm, fear, negative self-talk, or something in between. Um, and the first 10 people that sign up will get a one hour one-on-one -on -one mindset coaching session. So let's see, do I have that link? Sam, you'll see that I'm like copying and pasting what you put in also, because I am not sure that it was showing up for everyone. So that's why, in case you're wondering you why I'm- Yeah, doing thank you, Jamie. I appreciate that. I just fixed it now. No worries. Um, so I've got a few more spots available on here and I hope to meet more of you, especially if you've come to both workshops, like I'd love to hang out more. Even if you're just coming to this workshop, like let's hang out and talk a little bit further. Um, and that is all I got for you all. So thank you so much for joining. And thank you, Jamie, for having just yeah, I, I don't want to cut you off, but I just want to acknowledge the generosity you're showing to the She Jumps community. You are such a wealth of knowledge on so many levels from just overall wellness and nutrition and coaching and skills. It's really incredible um, to have you here and part of our collective She Jumps community as well. So really appreciate your time and everything that you've offered to this group. Um, just really thank you for providing so much knowledge for all of us today. Oh, thank you, Jamie. It goes right back to She Jumps. Y'all are so fantastic and been, have been so much fun to work with. And I met so many rad women already through this community. So y'all are doing something really, really good here.
So if anybody is interested um, in Sam's offers, they are in um, the chat. So I'll give it a minute if you didn't get a chance to like screen grab anything. Um, so if you want to copy and paste anything down, we are going to be doing a write up of these two workshops for the She Jumps blog. Um, I believe that the video recordings will also be available there. And She Jumps has a lot of events going on all the time, virtual, in person, um, all over the country. So definitely check out shejumps.org um, and connect with the community in your location. Anything else, Liz, to add on your side? Um, no, just thanks for being here. What a wonderful presentation. And um, I really loved just like listening to your uh, some of your perspectives and, and stories and lived experiences. So thanks for um sharing that and also just like some strategies it's cool yeah thanks Liz thanks everybody I hope you all have a great afternoon evening <laughs> night wherever you are and we will connect again soon bye